You grew up in Nottingham, yeah. comprehensive school. When does the acting bug bite you? Um, I went to the workshop in Nottingham when I was 11. Before then, I was at a dance school that had a drama area, but it was like pretend to be a tree. So um, I went to the workshop, but I didn't get in first time. And then there was a space, and I just happened to nab it. So when you say the workshop, so that's the, it's the quite famous central TV workshop right, yeah. in Nottingham. So, so I think it's the TV workshop now. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was the central TV workshop at the time, and you didn't have to pay. Right. So anybody was, you know, if you got in, it doesn't really matter about what your situation was. You just went twice a week, and I went for 10 years, so I got a lot of experience, you know. And I'm thinking up in Nottingham, it must be like local kids up there must be aware of, because it had quite a long tradition, must yeah. have been aware that that was a route in, that was something they could do. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, now if you look at the amount of people that have come out of it that have got quite steady careers, that's more so now than ever. Do you know what I mean? Like Jack O'Connell's only just, not only just, but, you know, it's in the recent years that he's started to pick up and get that kind of career and the fact that he's from the workshop... Um, you know, Samantha Morton and Toby Kevill and a lot of the guys out of This Is England. So there is a lot of people that have come out of it, but it, it's only in Nottingham. Right, right, right. You know. Yeah, I wonder what is it about Nottingham in that case? Because it's weird, because the centres of people who don't know Central TV works, as we're saying, you know, it's got this astonishing production line of talent and people who've come on, you included, made this astonishing work. What is, why is it not spreading outside Nottingham? Why is that not? I'm sure it does. You know, I know that there's places in, in Manchester and, and elsewhere, even Johnny Harris was telling me about the place that he used to go to, and, you know, we, we're all aware that they are there, um, but they can't fund that forever, so the workshop is not free anymore. But there is the possibility that if you haven't got, you know, if you're not in a situation to be able to afford to pay, there are ways and means of getting around that with sponsorship and stuff like that. Um, but it's changed, and so these places that used to be available aren't there anymore. How important was that at that point, that it didn't involve putting your hand in your pocket? Well, it was the only way. Um, we were talking backstage earlier, and, and somebody was mentioning sort of some of the drama schools and stage schools here, and I auditioned for Italia Conte, and I saw it as, like, the perfect way in. You know, I could dance, I could act and I'd do a little bit of English and maths. You know, that's how it was kind of sold to me. Like, you barely did any education and you just got to perform all day. I was like, oh, this is going to be great. And I got in. So I was given a place and they gave us a year to find the funds. And I didn't find the money. And we went to the lottery, the Prince's Trust, to our council, to friends and family. You name it, we did it. And, you know, yes, I'd have a completely different career, and yes, I'm much happier knowing that, that you know, the way that it's happened for me is this way, and I'm happier <coughs> in hindsight, but at the time, I was 14 and gutted, because the only reason I couldn't go was because I didn't have the money, whereas when I went to the workshop, it just wasn't even a thing. It was like, you know, we was all from different backgrounds, from different walks of life, and it wasn't even a thing. And also, like, we all think that obviously <coughs> drama has this hugely important part on the curriculum, but it feels like it's something different. The, the TV workshop is something different. It's like a space for kids to be, and it's not school. It isn't... Yeah, the thing, because <coughs> school's kind of weird. I, I, I didn't really enjoy drama at school. Um, I was getting so much out of the workshop that I, you know, I didn't really get as much out of it at school. But also, it's that hard place to be in where... You know, at the workshop, if we was doing an improvisation and I wanted, I felt really emotional about it or I felt like dicking about, no one would judge you. They'd laugh with you or they'd cry with you. Whereas at school, you're surrounded by people that some people don't want to be in that drama class. So if you start being really emotional and pointing out some, like, you know, performance, they'll be like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh, not the right place to do it. <laughs> um, so at school, it's, it's, you know, finding out if the kids actually want to be a part of that that group and a part of that lesson, you know. And at that stage, were you thinking specifically about the stage or the screen or just acting? Was it all just acting? It was all just acting. I mean, I did a play last year in Nottingham where I live, um, and I always said my first sort of stage debut or whatever you want to call it would be in my home city because if people want to come and see it, then come to Nottingham, <laughs> okay. um, which is why we didn't extend it to go anywhere else. Um, but... At the workshop, we did loads of plays. We did loads of theatre. It just didn't get seen, and it wasn't like, you know, hundreds of people didn't come to see it. But for me, I was just happy to be doing anything. 
you know, whether it was a bit part in Doctors or Wolf or, <laughs> you know, something on the stage or it didn't matter. It was just all a learning curve. We saw a couple of clips from This Is England. So This Is England, the movie, and then This Is England 90, the TV yeah. series. I mean, you've worked a lot with Shane Meadows. And I mean, if people haven't seen the film of Room for Romero Brass, go and seek it out. It's an absolute masterpiece. My voice is really high in it, though. Well, really you're young, weird. right? I mean, you know, your voice yeah, but like high. weirdly high. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Don't so judge watch, out for the, watch out for the high voice. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about how that came about, because you were young at that point. You were still like, in your teens. Yeah, then. I was 15. Oh. Um, and it was... The audition was for... Um, this 19-year-old girl. So I thought, well, number one, you know, I'm not probably going to get it. But the way in which the workshop works is it's under sevens, 11 to 16s, and then 16s and over. <clears throat> and um, I was the only one that got recalled from the 11 to 16. So then I had to go in and re-audition with all the girls from the over 16s, which was like the most petrifying thing ever, because we all looked up to them and thought they were amazing. So I was just really quiet <laughs> and just didn't really put anything out there and just didn't really want to overperform or have the spotlight on me because I was quite nervous. And somehow Shane saw something, thank God. I wonder, because we spoke, for people who were in the session earlier with, with the, the Young Actors session, we were talking a little bit about street casting, that idea of bringing in people for their first performances. And it seems like sometimes, without naming any names, that a lot of film directors then, you know, they get a performance out of someone, particularly if they're young, and then that's it, you know, they move on. There's no ill will, but they don't really look after them. Yeah, it yeah. feels a little bit like, the, with Shane Meadows, it's different, because obviously there's you, it's Thomas Turgus, who was yeah. in This Is England. So, I mean, is that fair to say? that? Oh, completely. Okay. He's, a, he's extremely loyal, and we are to him. Do you know what I mean? It's like when you, work, when you get to work with Shane, um, you spill your guts out. And we share a lot with each other, we trust each other a lot, and he gives you the opportunity that you know, he feels is, is right for you at that time. And that's how, when you work with him, it comes about. So, you know, he don't mind if you want to go out every night of the week and get pissed or, you know, do whatever you want to do. As long as you put the work in, if you come to work the next day and you start fading, it'll, your part will start going. Okay. Do you know what I mean? It, his, he's, he works on loyalty and trust and all those things, and that's, that's what we're all aware of. And the other thing which came through, I think, well, with Romeo Brass, and then This Is England, which was like a big success at that point, you know, it kind of broke very big, was the idea that this was a different sort of story. I mean, we're here, working class heroes. These felt like working class stories, and actually that they could be told in terms of the writing and the directing and the acting. They could yeah. kind of only really be told by working class people. I mean, is that fair to say? Of course it's fair to say. I think it's completely fair. And, I, and you know, I suppose with why we're all here and... and we, I think we've all been talking about stage. There's, a, there's so much passion about where you come from. And I certainly get that more and more as I get older because I get older and I, I hear more about how hard it was for my mum and dad to make sure I got that or I got that train fare or, you know, just the graft that it took. Um, the older you get, you, you start to learn, yeah, looking like it is hard. Um, with This Is England, a lot of what, um, apart from Johnny Harris, but most of the characters have got like a similarity to their characters. Do you know what I mean? Okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah, that's why I'm saying not Johnny Harris. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it has, it, there has got to be that authenticity there. And we understand that world and we can bring something to that world and it's real. So we've all got an idea of it. Um, and I think it's only fair that that's, and I know, and I can see that there's an argument for acting. You know, I've just done a part and I played an Irish woman. And you could say, well, you know, give it to an Irish woman. And I go, well, yeah, I get that, but I'm acting as, and that's what we do as a job. Um, but Shane improvises, so it's very different. So it's not like you're left with a script, you're left with him trusting that you will say the right thing in exactly the right place with the right truth. Yeah, it's difficult because it's exactly. I mean, actors are actors. You can bring things to different parts. But like a character like Law, from what you're saying, I mean, that was a lot of you who is in Law, and you can't with the best will in the world. If you'd gone to, if you come from a certain kind of background, you wouldn't have known that sort of detail, like that fine grain of a character. Yeah, and I think because we spend so much time developing with Shane outside, you know, it's the rehearsal room is as important as the day on set with Shane. You know, he's a unique filmmaker. So you can't always, like, you know, now I've gone on to work with other people and do other jobs that have got completely, you know, they're completely different. 
which is why I love working with Shane so much and I'm always saying like what's next right. <laughs> because it's always going to be my preferred way of working because all we ever try and do is find the truth and the truth is I understand that world and he understands that world and that's why that works. I wanted to ask you about the difference between TV and film because this is England obviously so it's a success as a film and then it becomes this sort of phenomenon on TV and yeah. you end up working much more in TV and it feels like actually it's well this is my theory, but you tell me if I'm wrong. TV is the way in which film isn't to reach an awful lot of people and to tell yeah. really big stories that actually connect with millions of people, whereas film, although film has this kind of glitz and glamour to it, mm. many films will actually just not find an audience and they'll come yeah. out and it's, it's a real struggle. I mean, is that part of your thinking in terms of building I don't think career? it's part of my thinking. I, you know, I get a script and I read it and if it's film, TV, short film, theatre, whatever it might be, if it's... A job that I love or a character that I think I can do something with then it doesn't really matter but I'm a TV watcher rather than a film watcher right. you know I love cinema and I love films and you know I don't go to the cinema as often as, as I should or as you know I used to but I will watch telly all day long you know and yes some of it might be <laughs> you know master chef so there's no actors involved but I will watch a lot of telly and I do like the thought of just you know, people sitting in the lounge and having a bit of time out. Right. And also, is it a spa it's like a space where you can see, we want to call it working class, we can call it that, we can just call it ordinary people. TV is a space where those stories can be told in a way, for whatever reason, maybe it's because of the, the, the class system within film, maybe it's just because of the money that's involved in film. Well, yeah, I mean, TV it's, you know, it's hard. It, like cinemas, there's certain cinemas that will go out of their way to try and make it affordable. And then there's certain cinemas that just know that that's where people are going to go right. and they keep the prices. Now, if you're a family of four, it's 50 quid. By the time you've done the sweets, which you can't not. Do you know what I mean? Oh, it's course. like, <laughs> can't. <laughs> so before you know it, you've spent 50 quid and it's a lot of money and it's too expensive. And, you know, where's that money going? Like, well, we know where it's going. Let me talk to you about Line of Duty, because Line of Duty becomes this kind of, you know, incredible success. Did you always know that was going to happen? No, I didn't. And, and I think myself and Martin Comston, um, who were both, you know, he was like a Ken Loach kid, I was a Shane Meadows kid. It was that kind of, you're going to trust us with a cop BBC drama? Like, this is, <laughs> this is going to be fun. Um, and didn't really expect, well, no, never expected anything to come of it like it has just sort of really, really liked the writing. Um, the casting was, you know, just very different. You know, me and Martin and then Neil Morrissey and Lenny James and Craig. And it was just, it was really interesting. And yeah, I'm really, really proud of it because it's gone on to do, to do well. How important is the, the writing? I mean, I suppose specifically in the context of what we're talking about here, which is class and, and knowing ordinary people, because it feels like a lot of the time the further you, you move on through the industry, you start with actors, and there are some working class actors who are still making a go of it. Yeah. By the time you get to writers, the ranks start thinning out, directors and producers, it starts getting more and more of a problem. Yeah. So how much of it is about getting, making sure that the stories are being told in the first place by people who know what they're talking about? Yeah, you're right. It is, um, it is hard to get from the top down, because that, that, to me, is what I think is um, predominantly an issue is that to get anything made or to have you know, anybody aside of the actors, the, the writers and, and the producers, who I know of, so it's not like they don't exist. You know, it's like if you speak to people, you might assume that they've come out of you know, the riches and actually then discover that, no, it wasn't. But you, know, you don't ask until, you don't know until you ask. But the top people are getting all the, the money and getting all the power and making all the decisions and therefore there's this group of people, the casting directors, the producers who don't get a choice. And why? Because we're missing out on great talent, people that you may never have seen or heard of. This is the other thing is if you haven't got a name or if you haven't got a big enough CV, you're not going to sell the show. You know, and that could be a really great working class kid who wants to play whoever. It could be somebody in bloody royalty. It doesn't matter. It's just if they're right for the job, they should be taken on. Um, and I think from the top, they're after so much stardom so quickly that it affects anybody getting a chance. See, that's interesting because that came up. We just had Leslie Manville and Naomi Aki in here at 
in the last session, they were saying the same thing, which is that there's almost a pressure to be famous very quickly. And I think that's, it's easy to become famous if you have money in your pocket. You, know, <coughs> you, have, you can put things into place. You can, yeah. Projects can be financed, publicity campaigns can be financed. Yeah, it's very expensive. I mean, yeah. you know, I couldn't take on a publicist all year round. I wouldn't want to, but you know, it's, it's expensive stuff. Everything that you see isn't all what it is. You know what I mean? I think people expect that everything's free or everything's, you know, it's not. The publicist stuff is interesting, isn't it? Because even as a journalist, I felt a bit naive about that, which I wasn't aware quite how much it's to do with. So when you see a certain actor on a certain magazine cover, they have often got a very expensive publicist yeah. who's paying for that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've taken on a publicist because I've had to have control right. of trying to make sure I'm not, you know, doing too much or, or I'm making sure that the show that I've done that I'm proud of is being well promoted because that's what I've got to do. I've got to tell people it's out there. Um, you can do that as much or as little as you like. There's many actors that don't and, you know, huge respect to them and there's many actors that, that do and that's fine, huge, huge respect to them. But I vary it because it costs a lot of money and I also don't want to do any more than I need to, if you know what I mean. And I live in Nottingham, so I'm not going to be up and down every five I was minutes. just going to ask you about that, though, because um, you've made a conscious choice to live in Nottingham. I remember I was talking about this before. You know, you could move to London, that'd be fine, but you've, just, you've decided not to, to base yourself up there. Yeah, it's not even conscious. It's where I grew up. It's where all my friends are. It's where my family is. Um, you know, my fiance's Welsh, lived in London, now lives in Nottingham, and... Um, it's because it's a great city, but it's also because that's where I live. I'm living proof that I've never lived in London and I've got a career in this industry. Um, and yeah, it was hard and yeah, it was, you know, it's maybe not going to be the easiest route in, but it was my only option because I couldn't afford to do that. And that was what held me back because I'm sure if you'd have said to me at 16, which is when I started coming to London on my own for meetings and whatever. Here's a load of cash, you can have your own flat and you can just give it a bash. I wouldn't turn around and say, you're all right. I'm just <laughs> going to stay in Nottingham. <laughs> you know, I'd have been like, whoa, let's do it. I mean, the other thing as well is I think there's a pressure on people to get a role and then, we're, again, we were talking about this in the, last, in the last session, to get a role and then just take off and they become an actor and that's it and they never do anything else. Whereas actually, like any freelance gig, whatever it is, yeah. sometimes people have to, and you did a little bit of that, you have to go and it do a job. Honestly, it literally, like it went from Romeo Brass when I was 15, I tell this story all the time, it's very boring, but it's true that I did a film, I was at school, I thought it was going to be, I thought I wouldn't be able to walk out my front door. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and then I found out that it was at six cinemas across the whole country. <laughs> so, you know, no one's really watching it. Do you know what I mean? I know it's, it's an iconic Shane Meadows film now, and, and back then it, it had done its thing independently, but it wasn't what I thought it was. So nothing happened. And then when I did This Is England, the film, I shave all my hair off, this is it. It's going to happen, and nothing. Again, back to the office and back to just working and, and just trying my best. And then I went a BAFTA, and I think the doors are just going to go boom. <laughs> and I'm not disputing that things didn't ruffle a little bit, but it didn't change my world. I was going to ask you, did the BAFTA change your world? No, that, well. it didn't. And it's, but it's, it's not... I, like, it's the best thing in the world, having a BAFTA in my, my house, because I never would have expected it in a million years. Um, so, yeah, I love it, and I, I'm hugely proud of it, especially because it came out of This Is England 86, which meant so much to me. But it's not like... There's no way you've got an open, uh, open door to this industry because of one particular moment or because of one particular thing. And actually, you know, you might get a moment where you go, right, I've really smashed it, I've done this part, um, everybody's loved it. But then really quickly, someone else comes and does that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and before you know it, you're sort of like back on the right, OK, I've got to get, get back, to, back to work. Does it feel important to you, because you are one, whether you like it or not, that there are role models now? Because you will have had role models, again, we were talking about TV Workshop, Sam Morton blazed a bit of a trail, and you come along... I'm assuming it's a nice feeling, but also kind of a quite an urgent, important feeling to know that potentially people are going to be looking at you. There's going to be girls in Nottingham now thinking, oh, Vicky's done it. Yeah, I mean, it kind of frightens me because, <clears throat> you know, I don't know, I don't know what the answer is now. 
I was saying this earlier, like back in the day I used to read Stage magazine and look at auditions and uh, there used to be a book, a book called Contacts from Spotlight. I don't know why. I just bought it thinking it was like, you know, I'd get the contacts. <laughs> I didn't really use it. But there was things that you used to do back then and I don't know what it is now. And all I know is that it's just getting harder. That's all I know. So I, I, I go, well, yeah, you could go to TV workshop in Nottingham, but you'll have to come to Nottingham, you'll have to audition, there's no guarantee you're going to get in, and then you have to leave when you're 21. So what do they do after that? Um, it's just, you can't just get an agent. You can't just... So as much as I feel really annoyed that I'm going to be sat here feeling like I'm being negative, but I'm, I'm being honest is all I can be, and not say, follow your dreams, <laughs> and just hope for the best, because that pisses me off when people do that thing where they just, you know, if, you, if you've got it that bad, then just follow your dreams. Yeah, if you've got it that bad and you're willing to take the rejection and you're willing to fight for it and you're willing to put the hours in and get a job and make sure you've got enough money to support your train fares and, you know, you've got to work and then you've... This is what... If you're working class, this is what, it, this is what it's about. You've got to... If you've not got... A, pocket full of cash behind you, you're going to have to work aside of trying to get the jobs, to pay for the train fares, to pay for whatever it is you need. Um, and then you're going to have to get a setback, because I've had thousands, so the likelihood is we're all going to get a setback at some point. Then you're going to keep pushing through it. And yeah, you, you may get there, but I can't promise it. See, that's why you're a role model, because you said that, because you didn't say follow your dreams, right? But I, I can't, because I don't want to I don't want to upset anyone. Yeah. The best advice. We, there we are. Vicky's a role model. We've got two more. Um, I want to bring to the stage someone else who's a role, model, a role model behind the camera. Again, let's have a quick look at some of their work, and then I'll introduce him. <laughs> Welcome, how are we doing? All right, how are you doing? Good, I'm very well, I'm all right. Well done for doing this. Right, yeah, it's, it's fun though, right? Yeah. Everyone, everyone's having a good time. I'm going to ask you the same question, or a similar question, to the one I asked Vicky. So you grew up, not in Nottingham, but you're in Hackney, you're growing up there, ordinary background, Yeah. and filmmaking, it feels like the one thing which might be even more difficult to get into than acting in films is making films. Is that, so, when, so when did that idea first kind of take root, and how hard was that? So... Um, yeah, because, you know, I'm, I'm from Muslim background, um, so Indian, grown up in Stonington, Hackney in the 70s and 80s, and, you know, there was nobody who was in the arts or in television or movies or anything like that. Um, and so I suppose my, my story was to do with, a lot of the time, never really doing what I was told or, you know, just from a very early age, because of my friends and the people around me feeling coming from sort of a political area, I would say. There's something about growing up in Stoke Newington or Hackney in those days. You, were, you felt like you were up against the system. Just being, just going to school, just everything, the police or whatever it might be. There was this kind of tension. Um, and then coming from a family, I suppose the youngest of five kids, helped that I was sort of left alone to do what the hell I wanted to. And they were very supportive, but they didn't ever say, don't do that, don't know. They kind of, but I didn't figure out to bring up kids, which is like, just don't get in trouble with the cops or something. You'd be all right. And then um, feeling very much, I, I was a guinea pig year of GCSEs, and I remember thinking, I have friends who I really like and love, and they're really smart, but they're not particularly good at exams. I remember thinking, I don't think exams are fair. And I, I was 16, at the age, uh, and I was like, I'm never going to sit an exam ever again in my life. I want to be judged on my work. I want to be judged on what I do. And I don't want to be judged on an hour of my memory. So I never sat an exam ever again. I didn't do A-levels. I just said, I'm not doing them. I'm going I'm to create art. I'm going to do something. I'm going to study. And I studied graphic design. I went to art school. And that is how I ended up in film. I, I got asked purely by chance to help out as a runner on a film. And it was like, that was the light bulb moment. I worked on set. And I thought, I've run away with a circus. And I love it. So in a way, is it almost, it's feeling like there are so many closed doors that actually you might as well just kick that one open, you might just kick any of them open. It, it was shut. to do with finding something that I was passionate about and I loved to do and I wanted to travel all my life. And my family couldn't afford to travel. We'd never went away on holidays. I'd never been to India. I'd, you know, we went to Boulogne on a school trip and that was about it. Um, and so I'd never been anywhere and I 
for some reason wanted to travel. And I think that comes from having a background which is from somewhere else. And so this idea of feeling like I'm Indian, but am I really Indian? Am I British? I'm not sure. And then becoming clearer that I'm very much a Londoner and a North Londoner. And so film gave me not only the chance to kind of work with people collectively on something and have an experience. And if you were lucky, it was a good film. It wasn't always necessarily. But also, I got a chance to just see the country and see the world. And I thought, this is what I want to do. And they, the people then you work with become your family and become your friends. And it was working on other people's films and then thinking, I'm going to make my own. And essentially, quite early on, thinking, I want to be my own boss. I don't want someone to tell me what to do. See, that's interesting as well, because I suppose the thing about film about filmmaking is that it is collaborative. It has to be collaborative. You, yeah. either, you either have to be like a zillionaire or it has to be collaborative. So was that one of the things that... Oh, see, that see I, think, I think that kind of... If we're playing with a working class idea, I think the idea, if you come from a background where you have to do whatever you have to do to survive, that is the best training for making movies. Because every film, you have to do whatever you have to do to survive. You have to find a way to raise money. You have to find a way to get this struggle, to create something. And then, do you know what? You do it all again. Just because you make a film that might be successful doesn't mean the next one's going to be that easy. You do it all over again. You start from a blank piece of paper, and you daydream. And you go, what do I want to make a film about? And if you're lucky enough to say, or even stupid enough, to think of yourself as a writer or a director or a producer, the idea is you just create your blank piece of paper. You sit and you go, I want to go and make a film in the desert. I don't, I don't want to sit here. It's pissing down with rain. I don't want to make a film in a pissing rain. Exterior desert day. I'm going to make a Western. <laughs> and, that, and that's literally how my short films were. And everyone's like, you can't do that. You can't make a film in the desert in India when you're a student. How, how are you going to do it? I'm, I don't know. I'll do it. My family are really famous in India. These are the kind of stuff I used to say to my film school. And they'd go, really? Yeah. Yeah, they know everyone. Not true. <laughs> it was like, just give me the camera and I'll show you. And it was always like, just give me the camera, give me the film stock, I will show you, and the film will work. And everyone's like, really? And go, I don't know, but we'll work it out. And, and that idea of bullshitting your way through is a part of it. And it's interesting about the sort of stories you could tell, because we were talking about Shane Meadows and the importance of having like, working-class storytellers who tell working-class stories. But also, you should have working-class storytellers who can tell any sort of story that they want to. I think that's, that's part of it, is that you should... It's the idea of, as a director or writer, to have the freedom. And my, my heroes, I guess, were filmmakers who often change the style of stories that we're working on, the genre. They didn't get stuck in one place. And I get bored. So if I get bored of this, I want to do the opposite next film. So, I, you know, you showed a couple of docs, but I've made drama, I've made short films, I've worked in TV. I did, when I was working at Carlton TV after university, work with people from Central kind of Children's kind of acting workshop, actually. We used to go up to Nottingham and cast people and make little short films for this late-night TV program called Shift that I managed to get this terrible no one would have seen it at four in the morning or something but I was like I left university and I got a job directing for TV I was like okay fine I'll do that then I hated it so I quit I said like, I don't want to do this I don't want to do this sort of stuff I, 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 I like to spend a long time making something right and th therefore I quit to do an MA and go back to film school because I did want to make films on a big screen actually it does feel like a lot, I mean you're right I mean you've made a huge range of dramas documentaries you've made films in different corners of the world it does feel like, to me at least, that you're, you're pulled towards like, underdog stories. Yeah, definitely. I think that idea of fighting against a system that may well be corrupt seems to be a theme that turns up, or searching for sort of home or a family. But all of the films are generally about, you know, there's a big, powerful thing and somebody who's trying to navigate their way through. And that's the case with the film I'm finishing right now about Diego Maradona. It was the case with Amy. It was like everything against Amy. It was the case with Senna, the kind of corruptness of sport in that case, or Formula One. And with The, the Warrior, my first feature, it was about someone who kind of has this feudal system. And I suppose that maybe there's a theme there, I don't know, that I'm interested in. And it feels like you're breaking it apart. You're sort of looking at it quite analytically and saying, well, I'm actually not going to be an employee. Yeah. Uh, my kind of hero when I was getting into films was Spike Lee. And it was seeing Do the Right Thing and reading books by Spike Lee and his idea of if you want to make work, you need to somehow be in control. You need to produce. You need to direct. You need to write. You need to have your family, your crew. You need to find a way to finance these films. You need to find a way how you're going to promote these films. How is the poster going to be? How is the trailer going to be? So I, I personally, in my own kind of way, am sort of control freak and wanting to be able to do all of that. And also the important thing of having a body of work. It's not about one movie and everything hinges on your debut film or your one short film. You know, when I look at Filmmakers like Hitchcock, I don't know, Psycho was his 59th film or something. So how do you make 20, 30 films that somehow, if you make four or five films, it 
that are great and that stand the test of time, brilliant. But you've got to keep making work. You've got to keep, and so a big part of it is survival. It's, I'm gonna make this film and I've gotta figure out how can I pay the bills, pay the rent and work and get someone to pay me so I'll do a commercial, I'll do a pop video, whatever it is, by any means necessary to make the next one and the next one and the next one. If, if film festivals then, what I learned quite early on, because my shorts got turned down by most festivals here, even going before that, I couldn't get into the National Film School, applied four or five times, never got an interview. Um, there were lots of stages we all go through where you kind of get knocked back and you just have to come, come again, go again, go again. And, and the idea of, okay, I'll go to anyone who will accept me, because I got turned down by every film school pretty much I applied to. And two weeks before a course began, I got a call saying, someone else has dropped out, do you want a place? And I said, like, how long do I have to think about it? And they said, you've got an hour. So I, okay, and this was, of course, at Newport Film School in South Wales, which not many people would want to go to. Okay? <laughs> but it changed my life, because I was like, okay, I'm on it. And then I'm of a certain generation where you know, going backwards, my family, working class Muslim family, mum was a machinist, my dad was a postman, yeah, um, you know, my mum didn't speak English, didn't write English, and she brought up five kids in Stokey. We, you know, free school dinners, school uniforms helped with that, I had a grant to go to university, I had a bursary. When I worked in TV, when I quit my job, I went to my boss and I said, I want to do an MA, but I can't afford to do it, can you give me some money? <laughs> and, and he wrote me a personal check. And I went to editors that I worked with, I said, I'm really sorry, I really want to study, you know my dream is to make movies, but I can't pay the fees, can you help? Because I'd saved up a bit, but, and they like, wrote me a grand each, checks. Because they were like, we can see this is what you're passionate about, so you, if you don't ask, you don't get. So this was all part of like, just this passion and dream, and like, whatever you've got to do, if you can raise money to survive and somehow keep working, then you're going to have to raise millions every time you make a movie. So that's just part of the process. Does it feel like things are getting a bit tighter in that sense, though? Because we always like to, there's that, always that nice idea that society and the world at large, it's all getting better and slowly getting better. And in fact, when you talk about like, education right. for a start, it's much harder, it feels like, isn't yeah. it? Well, because you and me so were the last generation, we both got student grant, yeah. and that doesn't happen anymore. No. So, um, you know, now, if I, were, if I were trying to make films now, I don't think my, my family could afford to send me to college or university, particularly for a mad job like film directing. I mean, are you nuts? How, how is that going to pay? <laughs> I don't know. But, but it was, that's the thing of trying to understand how that is a real job. Most of my friends who, whose family, you know, they may have been Asian, they studied business because that's what they thought would be a right way to kind of get some money and earn a career. They didn't even know film courses existed. But because I'd been working on films since I was 17 as a runner and whatever I could do, and then from being a runner, I'd be a boom op on the next one, and then I'd be laying track, and I was a focus puller on this one, and then a camera operator on that one, and a sound recordist, and I was a first AD. So I did everything on, on movies, working my way up on commercials and features, assistant editors, but I, whenever I got offered a job, a permanent job, I would say, I don't want it. I'm gonna make my own movies, I, I, and I would quit. I work for you, but I'm, I don't wanna get stuck working for you, <laughs> you know, I'm going to do it for the summer, I'm going to do it for half term, I'm going to do it whenever I have time, call me if you need someone, but I've got to, I've got to make my own films. And I have to say, I still feel the only way really to become a filmmaker is to make films, and if you can, you have to find some way to have, uh, you know, to be taught about the technology, to, to have a deadline. That's the thing, you can make films on your own, but it's the deadline and it's the being forced to think and having a crew being thrown together with people, having to find a way to survive and finding stories, that, that part of it I do still think is important. I mean, we're having this, the reason that we were able to do this day is because there is obviously this huge public conversation about actors and about opportunities for actors. Do we also need to be talking about working class writers, directors, producers, the whole thing, the whole, like everyone in every role? Uh, in, uh, in you, you touched on it for sure, which is the only way to change anything is to be at the top of the chain. You know, to be the exec producers, to be the producers, the directors, the writers, the casting directors, the people who make the choices, and then there can be a trickle down. Because, you know, that the only way to change it is if you have some power. You can fight your way up, but you're doing that one film or that one project, but if, you know, you're going to run the company. But how do you get to that stage? And so you have to somehow find a way to get in a position of power, and then you can say... I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to make sure you bring in some people, not just people doing a work placement because they're your, you know, they go to that private school, but because these kids here need a chance also, and maybe just spreading the word to give people an opportunity. I, I for me, doing work placements and trainee 
just to get experience on set was the best thing ever. I got, my, I got my bus pass, you know, paid, I think. Or when I worked on a feature film, I got a bit of petrol money. But I didn't care because I just wanted to be there to show you I'm going to be here for, if I'm here for a week, I'm going to be brilliant. By the end of the week, you're going to offer me a job. And generally, they did. And if I'm on a feature film, I'm going to be here for a few months, and by the end of it, you're going to be paying me. And I, I just had that kind of ego, I suppose, but also I was quite driven. And by the end, they'd be paying me. They'd be like, look, we, we haven't got official in money, but we'll... This is the old days of working on films on film. So they would like, we'll order some blue spacer in the edit suite. Pretend to order it, and then we'll pay you. And that's, that's how I used to survive. Well, what you're saying, it sort of echoes with Vicky's stories. You have to ask. You have to, I mean, actually, the, the, this no system in particular is not yeah, going to You've got to ask. You've got to be pushy. And that's the only way. Because that training to kind of just get some experience will then only help you when you are trying to make films. Because the whole thing is, why? You've got to push. You've got to fight every single movie. You're fighting with executives. You're fighting with other you know, financiers. Or it may be over the trailer. It may be over the poster. And you'll have lots of people in very nice, smart suits who are looking at you going, no, 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 we know this works. And you go, yeah, but it's my film. I've spent seven years in it. You're on it for two weeks. I know what I want to say. And I know how to get this to the right people. And having the nerve to stand up and speak your mind is a big challenge, but if you've been doing it all your life, and I do think that all comes from going to school in Stoke Newington, in Homerton, in Hackney, you were mouthy, you had to be to survive, and that then helps you get by. So if you're going to a dodgy school, it's all good, it'll work it out It is fine. good, <laughs> it's all good. It all pays it's not bad. End. And, and um, the other thing of kind of speaking more than one language, you know, I grew up in a family that would speak Urdu or Hindi, and so saying, well, that's a positive. If you have something from your background that is, makes you unique, if you are going to be a writer or a director, you use whatever is unique. So my student film I shot in India. Now, nobody shot student films in India in, in nine, you know, the, what was it, 17, 1997. I was in 96, 97, I was at film school. So I didn't get into the National Film School, the main sort of place to study. Couldn't get an interview, ever. No matter, I've made shorts that had won awards, but I couldn't get an interview with them. I don't know why, they didn't like my form, ever. And it used to cost 50 quid to apply or something. Um, but luckily, there was an alternative. There was the Royal College of Art. So I applied to the RCA, and I went there. And, then, and that was its own struggle. You know, most of my peers were public school. Most of them had kind of family in the business or knew somebody. And I remember having a particular case. They were all great, you know, lots of mates, still my mates. But I remember having a chat with some of the producers. And they were on the producing course. And they were meant to be my producer. But they were going, but Asif, how do you raise money? They never had to do it in their life, really. They, you know, and it was like, well, we don't, how do you raise money for a sh short film? And I was like, what are you talking about? That's what I've been doing all my life. You have to, you've got to ask. You're going to get out there. You've got to go to a meeting. You've got to say to someone, this is going to be brilliant. You know, I need a grand. I need 500 quid, 300 quid, whatever you can give me. Sign a check. Make sure it's gonna, we can add the tax on afterwards and all of that. And we'll find a way to make it. Whatever money you give us, we will make a film, and it will be great, and we'll put your name on it, and it will be in festivals. And they did. They went to festivals. And I think the film festival w was the reason why I kind of was able to form a career, because of international festivals. I got turned down by a lot of them here, but the films went abroad. And, that, and that's the other thing. I then would travel to the festival, because the British Council used to give you money to go to the festival. And suddenly, you meet an international filmmakers, international producers, actors, and you realize, I feel I'm part of this international community. And so if you feel like you're struggling at home, we're a tiny island. There is a lot more out there. There are other places to... My producer was French for my first two features because I couldn't find a producer here who really believed in me. So Bertrand Fave, who lived in Paris, never moved to London. Even though I lived in Paris, we met more often if I had a producer in town. So it was just this idea of looking at a big picture, you know. And certain films did well in America, certain films did well in Europe, certain films did well in other places. And eventually, they started to do better here. We've got a third role model to bring you. Um, you know the drill by now. We're going to show a clip of their film. They're a very fine actor turned very fine actor, writer. Let's have a look at the clip. Yeah. <laughs> how, are we, how are we doing, Johnny? All right, thanks. Yeah, it's got, yeah. listening to them. I got lost. I forgot I had to come up. <laughs> it's enjoying it. Yeah. So a lot of today has been about training as an actor, um, and you've got a particular story about training, about your journey into acting and into drama school. Yeah. Um, it's all I can bring to the story, really, is my experience, you know, and it's, it's kind of um, unorthodox, as we've all said, really. Mine was Morley College. Um, there's some people in here today, I think, from Morley, but um, it's like a, 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 not far from here at all, just near Lambeth. It's a, an adult education. 
class. And um, my story is I, I ran away. Right? I lived in Paris. I fell in love at 16 and I, with a French girl. I ran away, and it was there. Um, I was working as a dishwasher, and I, and I used to... There was a little art house cinema there. And it was there that I really got into cinema for the first time. Um, before that, I was a boxer, um, which is why I wrote this film. So um, I came back from Paris, and I just... I wanted to be an actor. I knew I wanted to be it. I'd seen Backbeat, the Ian Hart portrayal of John Lennon and stuff, and I knew I wanted to be an actor, you know, and um, I said to my mum, you know, um, I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to go to RADA, like, you know. And then I, I, I found it was like 50 quid then. I think it's near 100 quid now, but, you know, it just wasn't thinkable. I couldn't do it, and it's tens of thousand pounds per term. And, and my mum, bless her, said, um, Morley College, I think they do an acting class. And I was, like, flipping. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then I kind of, um, yeah, bless her, you know. And, um, and then I kind of sneaked in there one day because I couldn't go to RADA. That's, that, that was a fact. And maybe there's arguments that I could have got grants or whatever. I didn't know how you did that. I left school at 13. I went to school in Camberwell. I didn't know how you went about that. You know, I just simply didn't. Or maybe I was scared. I don't know. I, I, whatever the reason was, it wasn't possible. And so I kind of sort of was walking past Molly because I thought, oh, you know, and I went in and... Um, and this uh, teacher guy came out. It, it just so happened it was the night where they was intaking people. And, um, and it's adult education, so they teach everything there, everything. You can, if you want to learn a language, if you want to, and it's 40 quid a term, for the whole term, 40 quid. And, uh, and I was there, I just wanted, I thought, well, I'm not going to go there, you know, but I'll, I'll look at the prospectus, you know. And I was, um, so I'm standing in this foyer full of people and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, and this guy came out of the staff room and I said, um, excuse me, I said, um, yeah, I said, look, I, I want to be an actor. But you do acting classes, is that right? And he said, um, yes, I'm, I'm the... Forgive the impression, but... <laughs> this, this is a great friend of mine now, so it's funny to me. There's a few people in here who know him, and uh, Grant, you know. And, um, and he said, um, yeah, look, I'm, I'm the acting teacher here. I'm going to do a class now. Do you come with me? And I said, well, 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 hold on. I don't know if I... Like, <laughs> how much is it? And he said, well, it's £40 a term. Do you want to come or not? I said, I haven't got the 40 quid. He went, well, don't worry. Pay it next week. And I said... So what's involved then? And he went, look, do you want to come or not? And <laughs> I was just like, and then I sort of ended up chasing him up the road and <laughs> like he was a step ahead of me. And then I, next thing I'm in this class kind of being a bit of bacon under a grill and a sort of, <laughs> yeah, a tree in the wind, and, you know. And it was, um, I remember thinking, Gary Oldman doesn't do this, you know. Um, and that was it, right? And that was Morley College, right? And I was there for three years and it was the most disparate, diverse, wonderful group of people you will ever meet in that class. Elderly women, uh, black, white, you know, the, the whole gamut of the, the, the community that I'm from were in that class wanting to, some of them wanted to study acting because there was, flower arranging was full up, you know? Um, <laughs> some of them thought, I, I thought it was the next flipping day Lewis, you know, it was like, um, so yeah, that was, that was my place where I studied, yeah. And, and do, you and do you think the experience that you brought, I mean, you know, again, we don't want to say that no kind of actor can play, you know, a different, we're not prescribing what kind of roles different actors can play, mm. but there is a certain realism and a certain experience that if you come from a certain background, you can bring to a part. I remember the first time I saw you on screen was in a film, great film called London to Brighton, um, and I remember watching that with my wife, and we sat there, and so this character's this kind of shabby guy, and he's sitting in his plain white T-shirt, and I remember us both saying they've got that absolutely right. And we just clocked each other because every other film would have had him in like a feeler track suit. He'd have been all done up like a football hooligan. That's so interesting. And then I mentioned, I remember when we yeah. met, I mentioned that to you and he said, oh, and you're very modest about it. He said, yeah, well, that was my idea because he would, that guy would have, actually the wardrobe people all had the feeler track suits yeah. all lined up on a row. There was a load of them lined up. I went in yeah. and I think uh, <laughs> Danny Dyer had just done um, the big thing. So that was, kind of, maybe Lockstock had just come out. and So that was kind of the thing, you know, this kind of mockney sort of Groucho club version of where I'm from, which is just, you know, like, and I just sort of, and, um, and I turned up to play this character, and, and it was a, bearing in mind, right, look, in hindsight now, the film's come out, but when we made it, it was a 60 grand film. I don't think in reality now anyone thought it would ever even get seen, you know, but to me, it was, it was flipping gone with the wind, you know, it was like, let's, it was my left foot, it was like, uh, this is my shot, you know? And, um, and I remember going up, and it was the first time I've, after having done what I, what I considered the kind of work I didn't really want to be doing. I'd be going in and doing sort of like a, a, an episode of flipping whatever, you know, and, and, and just feeling frustrated, really, because they'd go, well, no, you're going to wear this and you're going to wear that, and then you watch yourself back on screen and thought, I knew my flipping instincts were right, you know? And so this was too big an opportunity for me. It was kind of a semi-lead role in a film. And I turned up for the wardrobe, and for the first time, I kind of stood up for myself. And, and the woman said, right, we've got these tracksuits. And I just said, I'm so sorry, they're wrong. I said, I'm sorry. And she said, well, what do you mean they're wrong? And I said, look, I know this guy. 
you know, he's not being, he's not expecting to come out of this flat, you know, and the flat he lives in, it's squalid. You could give, and she said, well, no, because he's got this many girls working for him, so he's earned this much a week. And I said, look, you could give this guy 10 grand a week, he'd still look like shit because he hates himself. I want egg stains on his trousers, like, you know, like slippers on, you know, he's, he's not a gangster, he's, you know, and, um, and it was the first time I stood up for myself, and it's funny because a lot of people mention the detail, and, and Asif's touched on it. There's a, there comes a point where you just realise you know what you're talking about, actually. You know, you don't need rescuing. You don't need people to tell you what to do. You know, I love the way Asif put it, you know. There comes a point where you just let your cheeks start to come out, and you go, no, I know what I'm doing, actually. I know what I'm doing. And, um, you know, and that, that was an interesting film for, in the subject of what we're talking about, because some of the reviews revert, you know, they refer to us as... Um, they loved the film, thankfully, and everything, but they referred to us as non-actors. A couple of them called me an untrained actor. <laughs> I was at Morley College for three years. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then at an another place I want to mention today, the Fringe Theatres, you know? By that point, I've been in the Fringe Theatre, the Union Theatre, uh, the White Bear Theatre, pretty much every London theatre I'd performed in. So by that point, you know, like, to call us untrained, like, there's... There's, there's something very misguided about that, is what I'm saying. and uh, so, so that's interesting, you know? And when you and Vicky met on This Is England, I mean, we talked earlier about how important it was to have Shane's voice and to have that, you know, yeah. that sense of, again, we can call it working class, we can just call it ordinary, we can mm -hmm. call it whatever we like, but it's that sense of the sort of story which doesn't often make it to screen. I mean, presumably you jumped on that as well. I mean, it, it, quite a role to have to play for people who've seen the film. There's, there's I mean, a common denominator series. as well between those two things. I'm not here to play the violin today. Like, I've got, I've, I love my journey now. I'm the same as these guys, and the way Asif said it, I look back now, it was exactly as it was meant to be. But I do want to learn from it, and I want to make sure that certain ladders that weren't there for me are there for people uh, coming up now. And I also want to try and make sure as much as I can that, um, that the ladders that were there for me um, are there for other kids coming through. And it's the common denominator between both those two films, you could argue they were both kind of breakthrough roles for me. I'd done London to Brighton, and like Vicky, it, you know, the reviews for it were astonishing. And, um, and it was like, here we go. Cut to um, on the building site, Wormwood Scrubs. I was cutting out and, um, and I just thought, what happened? Like, where's, <laughs> where, I thought I was on a plane to Hollywood. Like, and it, <laughs> I was on a flipping 63 to Wormwood Scrubs. And um, as a builder, by the way, not a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, 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 and anyway, I was on the way home one day, right, from, from the Wormwood Scrubs. I was cutting out this job they call cutting out and all my face was blistered from it. And, and I, w I just thought, I was down, you know? I was really down, if I'm honest. And it felt unfair, whether it was or not. Um, and this guy on the tube, right? This is not embellished, Shane knows it. And so this guy on the tube is packed, packed, and I'm covered in dust and that. And, it was, and this guy's reading a paper, and I sort of looked over his shoulder, as you do. I went, flipping out, that's me in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, excuse me, mate. <laughs> and, he looked, right? and, um, and it was Shane Meadows that picked five actors to watch out for. And he said, this kid from London to Brighton is good. And I thought, flipping hell. Anyway, it took his time, five years flipping later, you know. Come <laughs> but the common denominator between those two films were both those directors, both the breaks I got were working with directors, maverick directors, who didn't use casting directors. And I'm pretty convinced with both of those, and with Jawbone, to be fair, if I hadn't written it, I probably wouldn't have got seen for it, is the truth of it. If we really get to the nuts and bolts of it, because we had two casting directors in earlier, Shane Bagan, Des Hamilton, yeah. both, I think people would agree they're great. They, yeah, what they do is bring, they're, they're yeah. all shining examples. But is the problem casting directors, if we try and pin it down, not them personally, but as, as part, their part in this structure, that's where one of the problems is, that they don't, they don't know what they're looking for. They don't know when, the real thing when they see it. And they can't do, really. Because like this, this is not an attack yeah. on them. You know, This is kind of like, it's just natural that if I was looking for... Because I'm not one of those that believes only working classes can play. I'm an actor. I want to play everything. I've just played a king in Troy, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know. Um, and there was a debate about that, whether I'd be too London, and I kicked off over it. I went, firstly, to, to, can I just say two things here? One, I've played leads in a film where I've played American. You know, please don't insult me. I'll make the choices as to how he sounds. And secondly, I've started doing my homework. I've read the Iliad. I'm starting on the Odyssey. And every description I've seen of Agamemnon, he never had a posh English accent. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. I'll, go, I'll kick off now, man. Yeah, this is the time. <laughs> time to yeah, okay, kick let's off. kick off. Yeah. 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 I just want to talk a little bit about about the, the trailer for the very fine film that we saw there, Jawbone, which is your first film as a writer, and it feels like it's a very personal film in lots of ways. But it also felt like you might have made along the way 
quite a deliberate decision to say, actually, as well as acting, I also want to, it's all the stuff we talked about, I also want to take control a little bit. I actually want to yeah. shape these stories. As well as just being in them, I want these to be stories that I create. And there's many facets as to probably why that happened. I'd love to give, like, a, 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 a concise answer as to what... But it's like anything in life. Like, yeah, there's not just one influence. I didn't become an actor because I saw Gary Oldman. There was a million influences, from my mum to Gary Oldman to Daniel Day-Lewis to... Uh, to Shane Meadows to Vicky to people like that. I got influences from everywhere, from non-actors, from, and it's the same. Why did I become a writer? There was certainly an element of it, I think, that came out of years of reading scripts that just said nothing to me about my life, you know, like like gangster porn or whatever. I've spent a, I spent years trying to avoid films where I'm the either the, you know just the meathead, misogynistic, homophobic, racist white pig on the left, you know? Like, it's like, not all white working class people are like that, you know? And I wanted to write a film, yeah. And, you know, and, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't know whether that's because it's middle class people writing them and that's their version of it. I don't know is the answer. But all I knew was, was that I wanted to write something about the people I grew up with. Benevolent people, good people, heroes that I call heroes, real working class heroes. People who put the kettle on for you, you know? Like Asif said, people who write you a check out for, for a grand or whatever. You know, I remember Manan giving me a fiver, you know, so I could go to my class and stuff like, you know. These are the people I wanted to write films about. Mick Carney, who my film's dedicated to, the local uh, boxing club member, Grant, and, uh, Grant Davis here, fine actor himself, like, you know, he was a trainer at my local club. He then went and trained at Morley College. There's some good people out there, and I wanted to write a film about that, you know, and, um, and I just, I think Joe, Joe Wright said some. If you're going to write something or direct something or whatever, you need to know something about it that no one else knows. And rightly or wrongly, whether this is like, as he said, maybe it's ego, maybe it's madness, I don't know, but it felt like that with this. Of all the boxing films I'd seen, of all the London films I've been watching, of like, you know, and whatever, I just felt like there was something that I could say that no one else seemed to be saying. And Jawbone, there's definitely, I mean, we can say this because there's a happy ending with Jawbone in terms of the response it got, and it has connected with its audience, and it's been yeah. acclaimed, it's won awards. But at first, I mean, it felt like, I remember I was talking a little bit at the time, it felt like it was difficult for that film, the film industry, yeah. to know what to do with it. Because here was this story about this working class story, but it wasn't, as you say, yeah. this wasn't, you know, tracksuits and all the rest of it. It was yeah. something a bit more poetic yeah. and with a bit more soul, and nobody really knew what to do. Mm. And, um, yeah, look, man, maybe, maybe today's the day to be candid about it, but the, the, the simple fact is this, look, I worked so hard on the film, so hard, you know, and um, because I'm a, I'm a cinephile, I love film. I'm blessed to do what I do, you know. Like I said, I've had a lot of lucky breaks, you know, and I've worked really hard as well. I love film, and I made that film because I love film, and it's influenced by European cinema, you know, De Sica, um, I, I could go on, you know, but like it's influenced by, you know, my influences weren't kind of gritty London, uh, or certainly not some of the stuff I, I've seen. The point I'm trying to make is this, is we made this film, it got reviewed off the scale, like we couldn't have dreamed of a better response really, um, and yet it couldn't get cinema screens in this country. And it came out the same week as this kind of blockbuster film that got slaughtered, quite rightly, and that was on like 350 screens. I say quite rightly because I went and saw it and it was terrible. <laughs> you know, but it's like Ain't a million it? pounds on the screen. Do you know what? I actually can't remember the name. But it was one of those alien something, <laughs> like, you know, and, uh, and um, you know, and it was on 350 screens across London alone, you know, and uh, let alone nationally and stuff. We couldn't get three screens on the first week of Jawbone, despite the reviews. And then eventually I was hearing reasons as to why it was and none of them made sense, none of them. Uh, and I was in... I was in um, filming Troy in Cape Town and then eventually I just broke and I rang the producer up Mike and I said get me this guy's number he's a good man Damien Spanley he runs the Curzon and, and stuff you know and, and I got through to him I got a call to him um, he was surprised I was, I was, it was Johnny Harris here like you know what he did and I was wearing a cape I was filming Troy I mean <laughs> ridiculous some working class flipping hero like um, but look it was a serious phone call and it kicked off we went there, and he was great, man. He's a good guy, Damien. I'm going to meet him for a coffee because I want to get around this problem in future. But he, um, I said to him, what's going on? And he said, well, it's not really a Curzon film. And I said, I'm sorry. I've been a paying member of Curzon for 10 years. I am, I am your audience, you know? And don't think it's some sort of middle class, you know, like we're all film lovers, you know? And this is a working class film for working class people. And I wrote it deliberately that all members of, it's a spiritual film. I want the upper classes to watch this film and cry. I want them to learn something about working class life, genuine working class life, not running around with guns and flipping, you know. Um, and so 
at the end of the call, I think this was two, week in, two weeks into a three-week cinema window where we'd had no screens. At the end of the call, he said, OK, look, we're reviewing it on Monday. I'll take all this on board. And, you know, and um, they gave us screens in the final week. We had no advertising except there's a guy here, Mark Baxter, who did it all for us on social media. That's all we had. And those screens sold. You know? And then what happened then in hindsight um, uh, was the awards thing. And I think it surprised everyone. You know, we got like 14 nominations. But then it was too late, though. Most people hadn't seen it on the big screen where I wanted them to see it. It's heartbreaking, you know, because I am a proper fan, and so I walked past the Curzon, and for about eight weeks in a row, that window had flipping Borg McEnroe, which, good film, you know, whatever, you know, and, but you've got these two American actors in there flipping wigs, and I'm like, you know, <laughs> all spread all over the front windows, basically saying to London to come in and watch this film. And I just thought, we can't even get, like, one screen in there, you know, like, it's crazy. But uh, for all the frustrations, and I think all three of you have had frustrations, the other thing that all three of you have got in common is the work that you do has got over it, has found its audience. This is England. Is, you know, it means such a lot to so many people. And Line of Duty means a lot. It's a rich, hugely popular programme. Senna and Amy, I've seen people weeping at your films, as if, you know, in the best sense, you know. And Jawbone means, and again, actually with Jawbone too. I mean, you know, Jawbone came out last year. We did a couple of on-stage things like this, and we yeah. could, you could see the effect that that was having on people. So I was going to ask, actually, how we maintain, all of us, maintain positivity and how we don't end up just getting chewed up by our frustrations and for you three is it that is it just knowing that actually the work does get through eventually is it that yeah I mean I guess it's like if you look at my CV it's not realms of stuff it's quality for me over quantity so that means everything I've done even if it was shit I chose to do it right you know what I mean <laughs> But we've all got stuff that you kind of go, oh, you know, at the time it felt like a good idea, or at the time you just needed money or you needed to just get by or whatever. But I've never done a job because of the money. I've never done a job because, you know, if I didn't think there was something I could, even if it was the people that I was working with, the content might not have been quite what I was after, but I know that I'm working with somebody that's really going to, you know, that's a short film where they're really trying to push through and their heart's in the right place. So ultimately, what you get at the end is fulfilment. And that's all I need. You know, as long as you're making enough money to get by, you know, the illusion that everybody's a millionaire is bollocks. And then there's also the illusion that, you know, those that are can afford to sit and not do any work. And then they go out and make, you know, <coughs> load of crap. As if. Well, I, I would say it's to do with, um, you know, you have the struggle of creating a piece of work, you know, whatever may have happened to kind of write it or produce it. Then you have the other struggle which is the real struggle of getting it seen and getting it out there and and the machine the whole thing I've heard you know every director I've ever met has this kind of idea of how do they manage the machine from hearing my I've been in the audience when Scorsese has been talking and he's talked about the fight he's had against the machine and I suppose in a way what Johnny's talking about is you create this work and you go okay great I've done it you go oh shit this is where it starts mm -hmm. getting a film out there getting it seen so people even know it exists is the beginning of the real work. And sometimes you feel like, oh my God, it's so disheartening. But then as you do it, you have to get to know the phone number of the cinema owners. Yeah. You need to know the journalists. You need to know, you know, who runs, how does a machine work? How does distribution work? And the more knowledge you have, the next time you do a film and the next time you do a film, and then hopefully you have an audience that might discover your fourth film and they'll look back at that first film and go, oh my God, I love that film. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, I was in Liverpool going to watch a footy game the other day. They beat City. Um, and the taxi driver starts talking about, oh, right, are you Indian? Yeah, yeah, can't, yeah. He goes, right, yeah, there's this actor that I like. Really loved him. Most people don't know him. And he starts talking about this guy called Irfan Khan, who's like a mate of mine who was in The Warrior. And we have this weird conversation. I feel like, this is a bit odd. Is this a setup? You know, is there <laughs> but then you kind of think, how the hell does this taxi driver in Liverpool know this film and this actor? But that was someone I worked with 20 years ago. And I don't know. They, they find an audience. Hopefully, you just make your work and... You can only manage some certain part of it, and you just have to make the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And it's about making your own, I suppose from what you're saying, it's about making your own connections as well, so that when, for want of a better word, when the system is letting people down, you make your own system, and you make and your you, own connections. You, you, and you fight it from within. Right. You know, you've got to get in it in order to fight it. You've got to be in there. I've talked a lot. If people have got questions, now would be the time to raise them. So, because <laughs> the thing is, I, I, would, I would only say do and live where you want to live. And that's the reason I lived in, I live in Nottingham and still do it and did throughout the time when it was hard. You will have to come to London. This is where all the meetings are. This is where all the castings are, majority of anyway. Um, so if you can find a way of making that work, 
then you'll be fine. You know, I, <clears throat> I know it, sounds, it, it always comes down to money, but, you know, that's a lot of what working class is about. We don't have enough of it. And I have been able to afford to live in Nottingham. I couldn't afford to live in London back then, and, and still now, you know, I wouldn't be able to uh, sort of get a mortgage. So it's about dealing with your own reality, and if, uh, if actually you want to live in your home city, you're just going to have to get the train. You got the train today, though. You got the train today, right? I got the train today, and I'll be getting it again oh, really? later. <laughs> we got trains. But All right. I think what I was talking earlier, and it's just something that I wanted to touch on today, which is the casting. Because we've all touched on it, and auditions, I, you know, me and Johnny are on the phone every day moaning about auditions or, or, you know, whatever it might be. But actually, getting in the room is a really, for me, it's a helpful tool. You get to speak to somebody, you get to sort of maybe build a relationship. So in years' time, you still go in and you don't feel so uncomfortable. And doing tapes and everything nowadays is brilliant because it doesn't cost anybody. But it's also my, I'm kind of getting a little bit tired of that because I'm thinking yes it's fine that it's not costing much but what are they sending over if they haven't spoken to anyone that person's not there to be able to direct them to change it and give them the chance so I you know I don't know what the answer is to it but I want to highlight that casting is it's a very tricky thing to do if you're not is, living in London especially. Is part of it though being able to go and meet the casting directors and just get in across your personality Absolutely. so they remember you yeah They've got to meet you and remember you and go, you might not be right for this one. And I think that rejection is hard. But if you can just be yourself and be in a room and kind of somehow go, that person, I met them for that job, they might be right for this. I'd rather be in the room. And yeah. I love the fact taping is there because it saves people a lot of money travelling up and down and whatever else. When, you know, we was talking earlier that they always kind of know who they want at the start of a cast, you know. If you're casting a film, they're going to go straight to the big, you know, the big guys and see if they want to do it. And if they don't, then they'll come down a little bit. And then they'll come down a little bit. You know, and before you know it, you're up for something that, you know, is quite a big job. And, but they've, but you weren't first choice. So it's, it, it, I don't know, I'm really bitter on her. I I'm, well, when we did the workshop, it was like, we made our own films, we were given cameras, we were known as the TV workshop, so there was so many kids' shows back then where we got loads of experience and, like, P <laughs> practice and, you know, shows that were be being made really local. So we got to sort of go on set um, and get a bit of an experience in, in that. And then the theatre that we were doing, like I say, it was incredible stuff, but it wasn't being done on a very big scale. Um, I'm trying to remember what my point was. There was a point when you were talking, I was like, I'm going to say that. Um, have you got anything to add while I try and remember, uh. Johnny? <laughs> <laughs> That's teamwork. My, um, yeah, my, my, look, so my, um, again, I can only give my perspective, my experience, you know, and so mine was via Morley College, an establishment. There's others like that. And, um, and so my kind of gripe, if you like, not, not my gripe, I, I want to do something positive about this, which is this. I just want to get a commitment, and we're in the process of making it happen. I'm working with Andrew Gower, who's the principal at Morley College, and it'll include City Lit and other places, and then hopefully National, you know, places like Anisher, um, which has a great reputation anyway. But the, the commitment would be from the gatekeepers, the casting directors, the agents. You know, when you go to RADA's end of term show, you can't get in, you know, they're fighting for tickets. That the, that the elite of the industry are there to see who the new talent is coming through. And I'd just love them to be turning up to the Morley Colleges, to the City Lits, to the Anna Shows, you know? <laughs> That's not that difficult to do, you know? And so I think we're just at a stage now where there's enough positivity. And this is the whole reason I was interested when Danny first mentioned this months ago is because you sold it as a celebration of working class cinema. So we're not here to flip in, say, please help us, please this. What we're saying is, is when we get given the chances, we make work like this, like this, like that, and all the other work we know of over the decades, you know? There's, there's great, great storytellers um, in that class of people. And we cannot have it where, when kids come up to me and say, how do I become an actor? I want to be able to look them in the eye and say, you go to Morley College, you don't need lots of money. Go to your local adult education place, find your local acting class, work your flipping socks off, because you've got to be good. No one's going to give you charity. Mm. But if you are good, you're going to get as much opportunity as anyone. 
That's it's how like, it's got to be. It reminds me of something as if you're saying. I mean, we're too small a country to shut people out, right? We don't have, we don't have enough of a population to say, well, actually, you know, this 30 million people can't get their voice heard, yeah. right? It doesn't make sense. Well, let's face it as well. Look, if you're really going to push me on this, like, you know... Um, <laughs> only whatever you're you comfortable pushed with. Me, no, I'll tell you what, I'm, I am comfortable with. Look, if, you, if we're really going to go to... Some of the greatest films ever made for me, some of the most blistering performances you'll ever watch have come from this class of people. I'm sorry, you know? And, and I love... And let's, let's bear in mind that, you know, the beautiful performances by my great friend Eddie Redmayne, Daniel Day-Lewis. This is not me saying that we don't have a brilliant cross-section, but some of the most blistering performances ever have come from this class of people. Why are you going to shut them out of this business? Mm. No way, man. We're not having it. I think there comes a point where you just have to believe in yourself. Mm. And, it, and it often comes at the expense of making lots of mistakes. And like I see said, you know, experimenting to the point of madness, you know, where you, where you know what you're doing. You know, and in my head, like, I'd be in the fridge, I'd get laughed at. I, I'd be doing a play, there was one specific one, I was doing a play at the Union, and I'm off over in the corner thinking I'm Day-Lewis and doing all the sort of method stuff that I think you need to do to get to a great performance. And I'd be people sniffing at me a bit. I don't know, man, it worked. <laughs> you know, we got there in the end. But, um, and so I would say, look, I've done it. I've been, I, I got my first um, American role playing an American platoon sergeant in a film called Monsters, Dark Continent. I had like two weeks to prepare. And they said, can you play American? I said, yes, I can. Like, and um, I'd never said a TH in my life. Like for anyone, <laughs> like, I'm a Londoner, you know? I say mother with a V. Um, I say thank you with an F, you know? And, um, and so it, I was terrified because I couldn't do it. My, my, the, mother, I just do it, mother, mother. What did I do? I sat up till four or five in the morning. I just, you know, you do what you've got to do and, uh, and you get there and then you, um, you eventually somehow get to that stage like with a costume woman or any other, you know. And then there are people who spot stuff in you. I, I, with This Is England 86, I did this thing with the jaw. It, it came from a family oh, member. don't remind and, uh, me about um, the jaw. Yeah, and I wanted to, you know, and we angled the beard down and I remember like wanting this thing. With the, I'd taken that to two other um, rehearsal processes and it got shut down. Directors were, and they were both, not from my class, I'm just going to say, but they, they, they were both, and I've worked with great people. Please, anyone in this audience who's not working class, please don't feel I'm attacking you, I'm not. I want us all to be together and make great work together. But I got shut down in at least two other things. But then, um, what's that thing you're doing with the thing? And I said, yes, yeah, it's, it's when he's tense, and it got shut down. And I just, and I got scared to do it in the end. They'd be like, no, he's a bit more menacing, isn't he? And, uh, you know, and uh, panto flipping villains. And then, um, and then we got to, this is England, 86, and we was doing the, work, uh, doing the uh, all, uh, rehearsals. And we did this thing where Vicky was there and Tomo and everyone, and, I had to sit there and they had to ask my character questions in their characters. And, and I didn't know the character yet, I was finding him. And I was there and this moment came and I thought, I want to do that thing. But I was so scared because I'd been shut down before. And I started to do it and I went like that and I started to breathe because they was really getting on at me at all the questions. And I started to get angry and I started to breathe and I did the jaw thing and they went, okay, and cut. And then Shane went, hey, dude, what's that flipping <laughs> thing you're doing with your flipping <laughs> jaw? And I thought, here we go, I'm going to get shut down. I went, yeah, is it all right? I said, it's just something someone done, but don't worry if it's not good. And he went, oh, more of that, mate. It's flipping terrifying. <laughs> and, um, you know, I got a BAFTA nomination for that. And people always talk about it, you know, it's... Who knows, man? And just do you... your thing. Be brave and do your thing and believe in yourself. Don't ever be told that you, you, you can't do it. You can. And have you had similar experiences? Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually remember what I was going to say, and it connects. So I'm doing two. Brilliant. Two one. Um, which was, when I was in the workshop, we weren't really taught accents. So it wasn't like, you know, the part of the course was, this is the first year you get to, like, study Shakespeare or learn accents or do something. It's just like in pro, we're going to do this, then we're going to do that, and then we're going to do that. There was no real structure, which is what the beauty of it was. It was the freedom was down there. Um, and actually, if we was doing a play, I, th I remember doing a play called Essex Girls, and he was like, so just do an Essex accent. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. Like, but whatever I did, I did. It didn't really matter. Do you know what I mean? It was just like we were testing each other. So it's hard because I've come now into an industry where some people have had that training, and I mean training, and it, it takes what I've learned now is that you do have to work hard at it and find you know, a good voice coach, and it's, it's not easy, and I didn't have that back then, so coming into the industry now, it's, it, it's something that I haven't got in the bank, and yet you know, having to do certain things where you feel like somebody's making you feel self-conscious about it, or you're... Um, question in their choice you've got to go with your own choice because ultimately when the, when it's on the telly and it's no offense but they're just watching the actors people aren't 
always looking at who was the voice coach or who directed it or who dressed them or who this, who that. They're going to judge you and we have to take responsibility and it's, it's, you know, that's your choice at the end of the day. You can do, you know, because I do love it when sometimes the director will go, that was really good, Vicky, can we do that again and this time just do this? And I'll go, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then I'll do it exactly the same and they'll go, that was the one. <laughs> And I think I just did it the way I wanted to do it. So. Right. I, just, I, I feel like we're going to have to bring Asif in as the director. No, no, no. <laughs> no I'm just going to give you a, a, an example from behind the camera of this thing of when you're there. And I, I was working on a low-budget film. I was a runner. I was the bottom of the chain. I was working on this film, and there was a big crowd scene they were about to shoot. And they, um, the script called for you know, various people from different backgrounds, and this car was going to drive by. It was a long tracking shot this beautiful old American car. And um, the script called for two kind of Asian people. But when it came to shooting it, they had not bothered to cast any Asian people. And I was the only, I think, pretty much the only non-white person on this film behind the camera. And they were darkening up two white people. Oh, my. I'm the runner on this film. And I'm like, what are you doing? And they go, oh, shut up, don't, you know, you know, we're really hassled, it's really, you know, we're so important we're making a film. I'm like, but what are you doing? Are you actually, like, <laughs> you are actually putting brown makeup on white people. And literally, I had people saying, the old, don't have a chip on your shoulder, it's just a film, no one's going to know, it's, they're in the background. I know, I'm here, I know, you cannot do that. And they were like, and I literally was the lowest of the per people on the film, everyone kind of turned on me and said, you've got a problem, it's your problem. I'm like... Did you actually try and cast these people? And you could tell they didn't. They forgot. I said, give me two minutes. And I walked out in the street, went along the road, saw two people walking down the street, do you want to be in a film? Yeah, come with me. <laughs> I walked back. I said, I think I might have found two people who might be in your film. And because I haven't even told you, we were shooting in Harrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's how hard they tried. And I literally <laughs> said, I think I found two people for you. And we shot the shot. Now, whether they were in the background, whether they were noticed, whether they made the cut, I don't know. It was a piece of shit film. But <laughs> I was there, and I'm like, I'm not going to take this. And that happens all the way through your career. Yeah. Someone will say something, and they're like, oh, shit, you were in the room, weren't you? They go, yeah, I was there. I heard that. And I'm not going to take that. And you speak up. You have to. You live with yourself. Now, you may fire me. I don't give a shit. I'm not going to stand here and take you doing this thing. And it's happened in various levels, in many films, in many producers, directors, distributors, whatever it may be. And I think that becomes a part of what you are, right? You're there, you say something. And sometimes you just got to be there, and people check themselves, and sometimes they don't, so you have to correct them. And I think that's how I always wanted to be. If someone tells you, be a bit more this, be more, a bit more that, like you say, you, you nod your head, you go, that's a great idea, and you do it the way you would do it. And, and be true to yourself always. And in the same way, you know, if you're a director, you get set in a script, and it'll be like the only brown person is a minicab driver or a corner shop owner or yet another script from, you know, I have an agent in America, and it'll be another film about the Iraq war told from an honourable white guy who went there and blew up lots of people, but he suffers from it too. And I don't do terrorists, I don't do cab drivers, I don't, you know, that was always a thing, like, no matter where I am, whatever stage of my career, I pick what I direct, it's my name on it, and I will pick what I do, and I don't want to perpetuate this kind of cliches of people from whatever background or whatever ethnicity, so I think that's what I wanted to say, was that right from a very early age, you've got to kind of know who you are, know what you stand for, and just stick with that, don't let anyone tell you. Listen, we're going to have to leave it there, but I wanted to bring these three people together because they are role models to me, so I hope they've been role models to you as well. Please join me in work. And thank you, Johnny Harris, Azim Kapadia, and Vicky McClure.